Thank you, thank you, thank you, Justin. Um, Hi, Henry. You should keep talking when you say nice things. I don't think anyone said anything like that, that nice. Did they not like you? No, that no, they oh, no. pain in the arse. You're a bit grumpy sometimes. But, yeah, a bit I grumpy. Mean, That's the problem. But you're still quite sorry. good. I'll say sorry in, in, uh, up front. Hey, so great to um, have uh, everyone here. And uh, this, I think, is a, a really interesting one. It's probably partly about um, me trying to unpack as well uh, how econometrics and market mix modelling work with uh, media metrics. And we've um, got a couple of... Um, uh, marketers on the stage, and we've got an econometrics. Um, you know, Henry uh, Innes has got a brain. Um, we don't want to go there. It's too. It's too big. But what we want to try and work through everything we've heard so far this morning, which is uh, media metrics that determine um, uh, how the fo the fortunes of a company and the impact for for brands. Uh, are we seeing something different uh, take place at the moment, which is econometrics versus media metrics? How brands are shaping channel investment from hard business data. Does media measurement matter? And uh, for, for brands, this is, this is the, the question here. So um, on, we've got a list up, oh good, you, you know who it is. So we've got Josh Grace, uh, who's at um, sort of new Josh, aren't you? Private equity owners in at Colonial First State. Okay. A big, a big uh, growth agenda ahead of Josh. Um, Cam, Cam Luby, uh, who's head of marketing at, Op at Optus, consumer marketing at Optus, spent 10 years uh, in, the, uh, in the US uh, with Google on Nest and Home and a few other things, oh, and in an agency, uh, a creative agency, right? Could, could be Silver Silverstein. Silverstein. Yeah, yeah, and, and yep. San Fran, I'm assuming. So, right. um, so interesting credentials there, Cam, with on, on both sides of the fence, and of course um, Henry Innes, um, who's the co-founder and CEO of Mutinex, which is a uh, econometrics market mix modelling platform that is both uh, it started in Australia, a startup, but Henry's just moved to the US. And um, we will get a little bit of a, uh, an update, uh, take out on, on what's happening there. But Cam, I want to start with uh, you first. Um, we'll start before we get to, to, to econometrics and how you guys are using it. Um, you spent 10 years in the, in the US. You've seen the crazy fractured media market that is the US. What's your what's your um, observations on on the US market today? We're going to have lots of debate around whether we sh um, we're going to have fractured currencies and how we uh, you know get a total view on on the entire. Um, video and television system, but your experience from the US, Cam, uh, what did you make of it in terms of the media market first? Yeah, so I think, first of all, it's in incredibly fractured, um, and that's just because of the scale of it. It means there's a lot of media players that can be supported there, um, and that makes it really challenging for marketers. So I think in response to that fracture, one of the things that media agencies do is they set up, whilst they have the sort of the planners and the strategists that give you the overall picture of how everything should work together, it very quickly disappears into here's the out-of-home buying team, here's the radio buying team, here's the TV buying team. And, and when you... Mega silos, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, mega silos. And when you go into those fractured um, silos, it means that's the level of reporting that comes back to you as well. Right. So you very quickly have a range of, you know, here's the individual metrics for individual channels. And every single channel is saying, oh, we independently drove the brand X percent. Um, and the, the market is sort of sitting back saying, hold on a second, how, how is all this supposed to work together? Uh, and for that reason, you're sort of much more reliant on an MMM, MMM um, right. to tell you how things are performing versus your individual media metrics. So, look, well, look, you give us a segue straight into this. So, the, your experience, you've had, obviously, you've had 10 years in the US, um, and I think, Henry, they're using um, uh, market mix modeling, marketing mix modeling a lot more in the US than they have historically here, I think, in, in terms of um, the number of companies. But uh, so, in, in your experience, uh, Cam, going through Market, marketing mix modeling and econometrics, what have you seen it evolve? How have you, you know, what you first saw it 10 years ago, uh, or when you were first using it, I should say, to what, you, you, what you're doing now, and we'll talk through what you're doing with Mutinex, but um, what's changed yeah. about it? Uh, well, first of all, ha how I like to think about using it, first of all, is I think all of the individual media metrics that we have, that gives us a good idea of whether or not we're using a channel in the right way. Like, are we deploying best practices and the right creative standards, all of that kind of thing? Um, but it obviously doesn't give you a total picture, and that's where we would use MMM. And I think in terms of the conversations that we have internally, when I'm sitting down with the marketing team and our agencies, I'm very happy to talk about all of our media metrics, but when I'm sitting down with the finance team and the sales team and our product leaders, all of that kind of thing, we're talking about MMM and we're talking about contribution to the business overall. So I think that you, you use very different metrics in, in very different situations. I think, how has it changed? I'd be, I'd be interested in Henry's view on this. I think the, the big thing with MMM that I've seen is time. Um, so, you know, this is five, six years ago now, but when we were, when we were looking at it, it was, it was very much sort of almost on an annual basis. 
Um, like we, we were in the smart home category, we were very much orientated around that sort of Black Friday holiday. So we would get, you know, we would look at how'd we go in February after all that period, and then we'd use that information to plan the next year, and then we'd say again, and then how'd we go? Whereas I think we're moving towards a, a model where we can be much faster and much, much more responsive um, and, and, and be able and to... And cheaper too, or...? Significantly cheaper. Yeah, yeah. Yep, significantly yeah. cheaper. And then That's also... So um, yeah. Not that you're cheap, Henry, although you've got sandals on, the Jesus yeah. sandals, so I think maybe there's something, something <laughs> that in there. That wasn't in my appearance fee. Yeah. I, I like it. It says we don't pay too much. Yeah, it's, um, it's probably a bit tech, isn't it? Something like that. Anyway, it looks like we're going to give you a hard time, Henry, in this, but we're not. Um, so so I just I'll, we, we've got 21 minutes left. We're going to lose some time. Josh, um, I think it's probably good to get... You've, you've both um, been, you've been using econometrics and market marketing mix modeling on a couple of companies, Samsung and now yep. CFS. How have you seen it change? What's, what's, or have you just come straight into a, a, a did you use the old, old yeah, model? Yeah, I, I think it's exactly what Cam said. Um, the, the, the problem of the old systems of econometric modeling was at this point in time, you deliver it, and as soon as it's delivered, it's out of date. And you're going, okay, well, and, and what Henry's system does, which is so valuable, I think, whether it was at Samsung or now in Colonial First State, is it's, it's always on. Um, it's got you know, live feeds, we get monthly refreshes you know, with, with the team and you can be much more agile around how you plan it. Uh, and that's, that's, I think, fundamentally the, the, the game changer here on, on how that works. Yeah. So, Henry, do you want to give a, like a one minute top line on uh, how, how you see the, uh, how the evolution of econometrics and market, marketing mix modelling is happening? We've talked about it before, but just for the broader audience that may not know um, what these guys are, why these guys are using Mutinex. Well, I, I, I think the, the reality of market research is market research is shifting from legacy consulting businesses to SaaS-based market research businesses. And you're seeing that across a range of fronts. We are just another variant of that. Um, what that functionally means is that most market research will be transacted live through models very, very quickly that are fueling decisions and, and helping people make decisions. For me, next, our kind of key focus is can we get insights to customers around econometrics in a usable format really quickly so they can make really quick media decisions. Because the reality of the media market right now is the media market is highly competitive. It's easier than ever to change and to change media strategies and to iterate and to test and learn. And what that means is you need insights and feedback loops to be much, much shorter. Um, and if you don't have short feedback loops in today's media market, it is very, very challenging to execute in a cost effective and, and a way that will generate business growth. So what's happening in the US market, what you're seeing there? Because they, they've been big users, but they're not probably talking to these SaaS-based fast feedback models, right? Well, the US market's interesting, right? Because you've got a very fragmented market um, in terms of media, but you've also got tentpole programs as well that tend to aggregate, you know, like we were saying in sport before, tend to aggregate a lot of acti activity. So I think it's in, in when you have more choice, you generally have to have better analytics to make that choice. Like the average human can't make you know, thousands of choices a week. They need systems in place to help them understand choice A versus choice B. That's fundamentally where analytics comes in. And so I think, you know, in the US market, because there's so many more choices, MMM has had a lot higher penetration than Australia. But it still has the same problems. It's still, you know, really slow, really expensive and things like that. I mean, I'm, I'm aware that, you know, our nearest competitor is three times our price in the US, which, right. is, which to me is insane because if you're paying so much of your working media into analytics um, and to analyse the media, you don't have enough to actually you know, put back in to make the media work and to run the test and learns and things like that. Okay, I'm gonna, we'll get to, so thank you. I, we will get to how uh, Cam and Josh uh, both are and intend to use uh, econometrics in their, in, their, in their media and beyond. Um, but I think it's probably important to get a sense uh, from, from the brand side, from the client side, uh, their perceptions uh, of what's going on in television. So to both Cam and Josh, um, just tell us what you, like without, you know, you see a little bit of data now today, but if, you, if you're sitting back as a, as, a, as a CMO or a chief customer officer like you, Josh, um, what's your perception on TV versus BVOD versus streaming versus online video, uh, socials, YouTube and TikTok? Just a really quick grab of how you would sum all that up. Cam, we'll start with you in, in the jostle between all that. What's going on in your, in your mind as, as you look out? Yeah, quick grab. I thought um, the first presentation we saw this morning from the gentleman, I think his name was Guy, I thought that was a really good summary of sort of how we see the world. Um, I think that, you know, one of the big challenges was obviously the fact that these new streaming platforms, not so new anymore, are coming in, but that don't have the same advertising opportunities. Very interesting to see what's going to happen um, with Prime here. I think that that'll change a lot. 
Um, I think what wasn't spoken about was, was YouTube. I think that YouTube has a lot of momentum behind it. Um, and I think that's, that's only going to get even stronger. I'm definitely slightly biased given my time at Google, but mm. I think um, that, that, that's where my head's at. Josh, what are your... Uh, look, I, I think it just comes down to what Henry's model consistently shows. It's the medium that matters. Like film or video is still the most effective medium in that context if used right. And then it becomes about how do you get to the audience. And that's where obviously we're now seeing the challenge is, even in Australia now, the complexity of how you reach your audience is getting splintered, and so that's where you know the media agency's really got to come in and help on that side of it. But Henry's model can definitely help us go which channels, or you know, which channels in terms of not nine or seven, but TV versus B-Bot, etc., work. And we're seeing definitely that the streaming services and social media, video delivered through those more digital programs, are increasing in their effectiveness now over what they used to be. They really did a couple of years ago not be as effective in that space. And right. You're seeing them come up. So they're, they're changing their formats and models to make it work better for, for different types of... Uh, Specifics there, Josh. Have you, can, you, can you pull out something? Oh, I, I mean, I think a few years ago, you, you just you would never have considered trying to build brands necessarily through, through social media in the way that you can now. I think, you know, that, that was definitely what TV was used for in, in a big way at that level. But um, that there are formats and that are now starting to merge in those digital channels where you can, can achieve that as well. Yeah, OK. So let's get to the grunty bit now of... Um, I'll, I'll read the question because um, I won't remember it verbatim, unfortunately, but it's, uh, is this, it is this. Um, for CMOs and your brands, where does media measurement rate in relation to what you're measuring media for? And so therefore, in the end, are you trying to unpack business impact and does media measurement and metrics matter to you guys? Uh, that's it. I'll shut up there. Yeah. How about that? Good. Yeah, go, so Josh. Yeah. Let me talk through two examples. So I've got kind of two ends of the spectrum. At Samsung, we had a budget approaching $200 million. We're the fifth biggest brand in the world, but literally we had no share of voice. And the reason was most of our budget was going into sales incentives for mobile phones, you know, through Telstra and Optus. And we had to find a way to get media... He's right there. Give him one. Give yeah, him well, yeah, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> so, but I'm not there anymore, so I can say this. Um, but effectively, um, the, the challenge there was to prove to very, uh, I think, um, sceptical Korean um, people who had a very short-term view, because they were only on a one-year contract, that actually investing in media was as impactful or more impactful than what the sales incentives were. And so what, what this model enabled us to do was really shift a large proportion of investment back uh, into key channels like TV in particular because we knew that that was so much more impactful. And that then over time we managed to maintain that. We actually could grow market share uh, both through the two key categories that we did it on, which was TVs and mobile phones. TV, of course, would make sense to advertise on TV. CFS is a different issue. I'm in private equity. We've just spent $400 million fundamentally transforming the business. And we're at a point now where we've got to turn the growth lever on. And I'm dealing in a business of investment analysts people who are better at financial analysis than I will ever be, and talking media metrics means nothing to them. Return on investment is what matters to them, and you've got private equity shareholders who are counting the value of every dollar they spend, and is it going to deliver a cost-out benefit to the business, or is it going to deliver a return on investment in terms of new growth? And so again, that's why this measurement system is so powerful for me, because it actually, in a, in a business that was historically B2B, I can sit down now and go, here's the actual dollar impact of what marketing will do to drive growth to your, your B2B channel, but more importantly, the B2C channel as well. And so it's the metric that matters for me at the, the boardroom table and with the shareholders. And we'll get back to the metrics that matter for you in terms of your channel choice, media mix, and so forth. Um, Cam, for you, uh, in terms of media, well, you kind of touched it a little bit earlier, but do, do, medium, does me, do media metrics matter to you? Uh, if, we, if we only had, if we had to choose between media metrics and an MMM and only ever look at one of them, I would choose the MMM hands down. Mm. I wouldn't look at any of the, the media metrics. Mm. The media metrics tell us that we're executing well in a channel, but it doesn't tell us what marketing's contribution is to the business overall. And when we're talking internally, um, the, the thing that MMM gives us is the ability not just to look at media, but also to look at um, the, the channel execution that we have with the likes of, you know, the best buys or targets in the US or and whoever it might be here. Um, and then that also gives us the ability to look at the impact of sales promotions, 
um, and, and how different promotions will, will skew the impact of our marketing work over time as well. So I think it's the, it's the tangible thing that gives marketers a seat at the table. Um, if, if marketing is at the table just purely talking about reach numbers or you know, brand lift studies or anything like that, that's just not where, where business is today. Mm. I think the other thing as well is um, you know, we're, we're in a tougher economic climate than, than we have been in recent time. And I think I'm finding more and more, it's not, you know, tell us about what happened, it's tell us what you're going to get. Um, so the investment is dependent on the outcomes that you're able to lay out, uh, and, that's, and that is solely comes through using MMM. So we're going to get to um, both Josh and, and um, Cam on how they're using it, but Henry, um, if, I mean, I'm sure you'll, I think I've already got your answer, but media metrics versus econometrics and, and can, can a company, should a company determine um, everything based on, on, on an econometrics model um, without media measurement? Well, I'm going to buy to say yes, yeah. but, um, <laughs> but I think that, um, I, I, I think the media metrics can inform an MMM to a degree, but that being said, like a lot of us have used media metrics um, within models, tested whether or not they're actually giving us a material lift in a metric called a holdout test, which is basically where we test how predictive the models are. And media metrics do not help us to make the models more predictive. Not sharper, no, no. No, no, so they don't sharpen our predictive view of, um, of you know, whether or not something will or won't pay off um, by any more than, you know, 0.5%. So the, the material difference to that is pretty low. Um, I will say that, you know, I'm sure as measurement currencies kind of come up a bit more, maybe um, they may play a more significant role. But for us, like, really what we're looking at is if you, did a, took a certain, if you did a certain piece of activity out or something like that, do you see an incremental lift in the P&L? Um, and that, I think, is fundamentally more important than did we trade against, you know, somebody two or three times? Because what... What we actually want to know in marketing is not not whether not not you know how often we're hitting people, but if we spend this money, does this generate incremental lift? And I think that is the fundamental problem um, that marketers are looking to solve when they spend money, and businesses are looking to solve when they spend money in the media market. And so articulating that, being very sharp on that, is what tends to unlock budgets. Okay, it's pretty, well, it's pretty um, interesting too when. The CFO comes to you and says, I want to cut budget because we're not hitting targets. And you run it through the model and you go, well, okay, here's the sales impact. Yep. Right. And they go, oh. Have you done that, Josh? Uh, well, we, yeah. I mean, that, that's effectively what we did at Samsung, was show mm. them, you know, you're taking money away from media. This is the impact. When COVID hit, you know, we could show them the impact. Haven't done it so much here because we're, we're not into the full-blown uh, marketing of the brand yet. We're just doing the back-end build. So that's nice. I, I mean, if you're showing a, like, if you're building a model out and things like that and then a budget cut is associated with a revenue cut, it's a very compelling argument um, because nobody in a business wants to cut revenue. No one wants to cut profitability. And marketing too often is seen as like divorced from profitability and revenue. Whereas in a business, marketing and distribution are generally the only things that affect profitability and revenue. Mm. And so and hence why, so Cam, let me, let me ask you then, your ambitions and intent. I think you're early in the deployment of, the, of the, this current Model, is that right? Where are you at with it? Yeah, early with um, Mutant X, so Henry and his team. So very much looking forward to getting off the ground with that. We've had a, pr a previous partner um, that, that we've used for a while. That's at Optus, and then obviously in the US as well, um, and a number of different partners there too. So what's the ambition uh, for what you're doing now uh, at, at Optus? And, and it gets down to this whole thing. Can you, can you determine channel choice and allocation and, and weighting and do you, based on your economy, on your market mix modelling, um, how, how, how influential is it? So yes, and I hope to go even further with it as well. So I, I don't want to use this just purely as a tool for marketers to inform channel decisions, mm. but as a tool for us to look at how the entire business works. So what are the channel choices that we're making? What are the sales promotions and incentives that we have at any given time? Should we be wetting those up and down? Should we be moving money back and forth in, in order to try and get a, a stronger EBIT outcome for the company overall? Like at the end of the day, you know, marketing campaigns and, and all this stuff, all, all, all the really matter, all the business cares about is what are, what are we getting back to the shareholder? Impact, right. and, 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 and if it opens the door to uh, an open and transparent conversation that we can be having with our sales teams, with our product teams, with the finance team about how we structure ourselves overall and, and where, where we want to make our bets and where we want to lean back. 
I think that's that's a really really powerful thing. So mm -hmm. I think that that's certainly the ambition for us. And I think it's um, you know, is it is it a crystal ball? It's I think it's getting reasonably close. So, so, so margin of error in some of the stuff that some of the things that you've been doing is it both predictive or uh, allocation of, of channel and so forth and what comes back. It's kind of clearly within range for your tolerance. Yeah, so this, this isn't something that we've done with, um, with, with Henry, but with our, sort of all of our brand tracking um, and then all of our um, sales modeling that we have, um, we've, we've been able to correlate our brand tracking, our brand tracker to our sales. Um, it correlates 78%. 78? 78 percent. Okay. So that's that. Just being able to go back to the business and say right, and, and the delta there is is what we're doing with all of our different sales promotions at any given time. So right. that that the, that kind of number and that kind of metric is is incredibly incredibly powerful for us internally. And I think this what we're going to do with Henry is going to. And you're doing it. something. Well, you 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 said something very interesting in our, in our um, earlier conversations in that uh, what you're using paid media for is actually probably the flip is what I would perceive it. You're not using it for customer acquisition. You've discovered something. Talk through. Yeah, well, f for both. So, I mean, the, the, the way that the business works is we're obviously trying to acquire new customers, but then also we're constantly making sure the customers we do have are renewing um, and adding more business with us. Um, and, and, you know, this is overly simplistic, but the way that we all sort of like, you know, quickly thought about it was we have customer marketing channels, be it, you know, EDMs, SMS, our app, that, those kind of things that we're using to talk to our customers. And then we also have paid media, and that's, that's where we're reaching new customers there, or pe people that aren't currently our customers. And sort of the mental model was, this is, this is talking to our existing base, and then this over here is talking to new potential customers. Um, but what we've seen through, through previous modeling work is that the paid media actually serves a, a more significant role in helping us renew and maintain a healthy base um, than it does in actually bringing new customers. So it's an incredibly important part of, of talking to our own base. And, and we just hadn't thought about it that way before. Mm. Um, so that, I mean, the, the good thing for, for us is... It would impact your messaging too, though, wouldn't it? It would impact, it, your it, it impacts the messaging. And obviously, we have the ability to, to talk, you know, with, with certain digital partners. We have the ability to talk directly to our own base. And then we have the ability to talk to people that we know are not in our base. Um, so it, it impacts our messaging and, and, and it changes, it, it increases the attribution that we have in marketing. And yes, you, you're trying to go somewhere like that um, yourself, yep. Josh, aren't you? Just talk, talk through that a little bit. Yeah, so I mean, I, I think the challenge for Henry or for any econometric model is typically it looks at acquisition and, and new wins. Uh, I've got a really interesting business. We, we, our key measure internally is a thing called NetFlow, which is you guys, most of you will have superannuation. Every month your super gets paid into your super account. That comes to me as an inflow, but equally I then have customers who also leave the business, and so I get a net flow measure. So, but what Henry's model does for me is it looks at the inflow benefit of media activity. Now I get $25 billion a year of inflow, but I also get $25 billion a year of outflow, so effectively I mean, if I use net flow as the metric with Henry, I would see no correlation at all, so we have to use inflow. But if I could also use media to drive an, a retention or an, a, a, a save on that other $25 billion, well, then I can actually show to the business that the ROI isn't $150 for every dollar invested on media, which it currently is. It could well be $300. Well, guess what? That's a much stronger conversation for me to go to the CFO and go, give me more money, because I'm both saving a lot of money on one side, leaving the business, and also then bringing in more money. And the two things will feed each other. Not easy to build, and Henry and I are in conversation how to do it, but if we can find a way to measure that, I think it's going to untap a real... Uh, Opening of the purse strings in yeah. order. So and so, Josh. And if we talk to we talk uh, in our final minutes to this room in terms of your experience, uh, perhaps at Samsung and, and what you plan to do at uh, at Colonial, um, did Econometrics or how did Econometrics change your marker, your channel allocation and channel planning, your mix? Did it did it have an impact? Or did it yeah, well, you? I, like the, the classic one was uh, when I joined Samsung, our advertising for TVs, selling TVs. 92% of the investment was in search and digital channels. I'm like, wouldn't you actually advertise to people watching TV that they should have, right. that should buy a new TV? So, um, so effectively, the econometric model just showed we, we shifted it back to 60% of the investment. Yeah, but I've got to say, I, I wouldn't need an econometrics model. To no, you wouldn't. That. <laughs> you wouldn't. But, shit, but trust really. me, you, you had Koreans who were like, we want everything to be digital. I'm like, but digital isn't right, as right, effective right. as you think it is. And Brent Smart actually had a great analogy on in social a couple of days ago where he said it's like having a chandelier 
analyzer light. And digital is great in some regards to, to hit a particular target and drive a particular outcome. But if you want to light the whole room up, you use a chandelier. And I think that's what channels like TV do, is that it really helps us reach a really broad audience. And, and uh, despite the emergence of streaming TVs and everything, on our model, same at Samsung, TV is still the most effective medium because the power of the medium creates an emotion that no other channel, outdoor others, can create. And that's why it's still so effective. Is that coming into, you, Cam, for you, is it the same thing? Or what happens, what's happening? And then I'm going to get to Henry on a macro on the pool, on your, on your, on your media pool. Yes, the same trends. So I think, you know, obviously the business likes search because it can see the immediate result of that. It can see people on the website, and that's a good mm -hmm. thing. Whereas when you're running on TV, it's it's tougher to, to say here's the immediate impact of that. That's that's why an MMM is so important. Um, and I think we see the same trends. I, I would say video overall yeah. is the is the thing that, that is most impactful for us. And then how we deploy video across different channels. Um, TV is definitely a part of that mix. But, but so, so Henry, the pool you've got maybe a couple of billion in Australia yeah, now. Is that right? A couple of billion in Australia. Um, what are you seeing? I mean, I think the the critical thing we're seeing is that increasingly. It's less about, you know, TV and, you know, various digital platforms and things like that. It's, can I get a video asset on a screen and how big is that screen? Um, it tends so to be quite screen size important is important, factor. is that what you're saying? I mean, there's a whole range of factors in advertising. Like, you, you need a mix to be effective, right? It's not one channel or another channel. It's a mix of channels working together on different objectives. But the one thing I will say is increasingly it's about how can you get a strong video asset on a screen um, is a really key part of that mix. Um, and that's what we're seeing drive effectiveness. Um, now, whether or not we still need to like class it as TV versus mm. you know, digital, I'm not sure that's the most helpful rubric, um, particularly given what we just saw with most people starting to consume things through various distribution platforms and they're consuming that content through a whole range of platforms. So, so I think you know, where, you've got to go where attention is, in, 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 and that's what we're seeing across our pool. Final soundbite as we get up, because we've been told to get off is, um, so where, where does media, Henry, this is your perspective with, with Econometrics, where does media and media agencies, like what is, if, if you're starting to work through ch um, channel allocation, then what happens to the rest of the food chain? Well, we understand what. I think media agencies tend to understand why. Um, in that role, um, and so I think that, you know, more analytics just means we can understand the whys better. Great. Um, sorry it was too short, but um, there we go. That's what's coming to us all uh, at a <laughs> galaxy near you. Thank you. Put your hands together. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, mate. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, that was brilliant. I thought the Birkenstocks were well punchy. Um, I'm tempted to, to try them out next year myself, so uh, give me some feedback on that later on in the day. Right, this next session, we've talked about it a lot, actually. I'm going to sit here because I've got an awful crick in my neck. Um, we talk about young people on television, what the problem is, what the reality is, what the perceptive bias is. Oh, by the way, a little bit of housekeeping. I'm glad people are doing it. People are standing at the back. It's a very busy day. There's lots of seats at the front here. You can be brave. Come up here. Oh, just, just come on stage. Yeah, no, that's all right. You take a seat. You take a seat. I tell you what, I tell you what, I was a little late there. Um, ladies and gentlemen, my guest, there's Dai Ho. Guy Burbridge and Jackie Edwards. Massive round of applause. So sorry, Jackie. So punchy. 